All right, happy Sabbath, church. It's good to be back home in Australia. <laughs> um, as you may uh, know, today is our communion service, and we're going to do something a little bit differently today. You, you, you guys down for a bit of an experience today? People are looking at me suspiciously. They're like, he needs to go back to America. Uh, <laughs> um, we're going to do something a little bit differently today. Um, Christian is setting up a little table, and um, on it, I am, we're going to celebrate Jewish Passover today. Anybody keen to celebrate Jewish Passover today? Uh, it's like, I don't know what's going on. All right. Um, so we're going to do a Jewish Passover today. This was something I wanted to do last year when we were going through our Luke series. Thank you, Christian. I'm going to get you to grab those two chairs over there as well. And um, didn't have the time, but I want to do it today. We are, I'm really excited, just so you know, as we uh, continue along the year, we're going to follow from our Luke series last year. Pass this over here. And um, we are going to pick up in Acts, okay, after big camp. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I'm going to pull this over this way just a little bit, and um, in my little tray of goodies are uh, all of the, the, the requisite things to do a Jewish Passover, okay? But the only thing I'm missing at this point in time is some family, okay? So I have adopted some people into my family today. I'm going to invite them up. There's Jean Latola and Jess. Thank you, Jess. Please come on up. Um, they're going to be in my Jewish family today, all right? Um, please smile at them, okay, because it's a bit daunting to be in somebody's family. Um, Jean, can I get you to set the table, please? Um, we've got a few different things here. They will all become apparent as we um, go through the service. Uh, Jean, I need you to put uh, maybe three pieces of bread in that plate. And uh, maybe, Jess, if you could pour into... Each of us needs three cups, okay? And I, three for each of us. And you're going to see, this is in the Bible, right? Who's excited? You excited? Okay, so we're going to do something special today. We each need three cups, and I need you to fill the cups with juice, uh, or, okay? So whilst they're doing their thing, let's get into it, all right? So we're celebrating Passover um, I've been thinking, how do I talk about my trip? There's no time to talk about the trip today, except for this. We're celebrating a meal. Having spent almost a month in America, I can see why there is obesity in America. If your pastor spent another month, he may have come back twice the weight he is today. Uh, lots of rich food, lots of sugar. Uh, it was a lot of temptations there. And um, I'm glad I went with Pastor Fraser because he's a strict vegan. And he kept me, he kept me um, on the straight path. Amen? <laughs> All right. Let's get into the service. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads one more time with me as we launch into our Passover meal. Father in heaven, Lord, uh, thank you. You've been a part of this service. We've sung. We've worshipped. We've given back. We've returned to you through our tithes and our offerings. I'm just asking you to continue to be a part of this afternoon or this morning's service. Um, as we sort of walk through the things that Jesus would have walked through some 2,000 years ago, Jesus thought this was really important, and I think there's value in seeing what he was leading his disciples through. So be with us as we journey through the welcome table this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So here we have a few different elements, um, and we're gonna, they'll become apparent as time goes on. One of my hopes, whilst I'm with you at Pakenham, I would love to actually do a proper meal where the whole church sits down and celebrates communion. I did this once at the last church I served. Where I'm like, can we try this? And they're like, let's do it. And instead of a church lunch, we did communion. And it's seriously, arguably the best communion I've ever had. To sit down with brothers and sisters in Christ, people I call family in Jesus, and to celebrate this meal as it was originally intended to be celebrated. 
We celebrate with little symbols of juice and tiny bite-sized portions. But man, this was a meal. It was a feast. And Jesus thought, I need you to catch this, guys, before we go any further. There is meat, by the way. Everyone's looking at that. Some people are wishing, I wish he had asked me to sit here. Some people are like, I'm glad he didn't ask me. So it's all good. Jesus, I need you to see this. Before we go any further in this message, Jesus is about to die, right? And thank you, Shenanda, for singing that song because I think it fills out the part of the sermon that I could not preach today, but it tells the story, right? Jesus walking down the Via Dolorosa, the whipping, the scourges, dying on the cross on our behalf. Now, just before Jesus is about to go through that experience, the last things he does with his 12 would arguably the most important thing that he needs to do, right? When you know that you're going to die, the things that you say, the things that you do, the things that you communicate are powerful in those moments, right? And here's the thing, Jesus doesn't preach a sermon, right? Jesus doesn't give a lecture. The most important thing that Jesus will do before he dies is, I need to eat a meal. Can you register that? Have any of you ever placed so much significance on a meal? A meal being the most important thing you need to do before, you know, no one here has died, but if you were going to die, would this be the most important thing that you need to do? Well, Jesus thought that this needed to be done. So Jesus is going to take a meal, which is a 1,500 years old at this point in time, right? And I just need you to see um, the boldness of Jesus, because he's going to take this 1,500-year-old meal and put himself in the middle of it. I don't know about you guys, but my family, we love doing celebrating Christmas. The most significant meal in my family is Christmas dinner or Christmas lunch. Anybody here the same? Now imagine if Pastor Ryan comes to your house and someone's cutting the turkey or the tofurkey, depending who you are, and I say, the turkey is all about me. You guys would be like, get out of my house, <laughs> right? Who is this guy? Come into our house and tell us to, you know, how to interpret Christmas dinner. The, the, the Christmas barbecue. I am the, 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 the sacrificial lamb on that grill. Get out, Pastor Ryan. But Jesus is going to superimpose his experience into this meal. Okay? Now we're going to pick up, we're going to walk through this story so thank you, Matteo, for reading it. Uh, Luke 22, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, we're just walking through the story today. And we're trying to see what a Jewish person in the first century, uh, and even to this day, how they would have celebrated this meal. Now, we're doing the truncated version. There are so many layers to this. If we were to do this properly, we'd be here for two hours, and I might lose my job. So Luke 22, and we're going to pick up in verse 7, Okay. Now, the story picks up like this. It's been, um, just for context, if you remember back to our Luke series, this is Jesus in Jerusalem. Um, it's been a crazy week, all right? And he knows that he's journeying to the cross. So we pick up in verse 7. Now, the first day of unleavened bread came on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And so Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it, okay? So Jesus' final meal, it's recorded in every gospel, okay? There's some seeming contradictions, okay? Matthew, Mark, and Luke say it was Passover. John says it's the day before. What we do know is that this meal is being celebrated 12 to 24 hours before actual Passover, now, just remember what Shenando is singing about going down the Via Dolorosa, because that night was when everybody would have been celebrating Passover. The Passover lamb is literally killed, and people are eating Passover lamb. So Jesus can't do this meal right on the day. Does that make sense? So 24 hours to 12 hours before, Jesus will do this meal with his disciples, which already to them is going to be like, what are we doing this early for? This doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is the context, all right? 
So we, pick, we continue in verse 9. They said to him, these are the disciples, uh, where do you want us to prepare the meal? Verse 10, and he said to them, when you have entered the city, it's the city being Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Now, this gets a little bit uh, James Bond secret spies here. If you read between the lines, okay? Now, I want you to read between the lines with me. The city of Jerusalem now has everybody coming to celebrate Passover. The city will swell to about 100,000 people. If you ever go, anybody have any holiday homes or like to go to the beach over summer? You know, when you go to the Mornington Peninsula, we like to go to Marimbula sometimes. And if you go to Marimbula any time of the year, other than like Christmas and Easter, it's dead quiet. And the locals will tell you, come the holidays, it is packed. You know what I'm talking about? This is Jerusalem, packed to the rafters, people everywhere, about 100,000 Jews from all over the world, okay? It's a lively environment. It's a festival environment. There's music, there's partying, there's food, there's open doors. So it's a great place to be, all right? Now, there are some interesting details Jesus says in verse 10. He said to them, when you enter the city, there will be a man carrying a pitcher of water, and he's going to meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover, the meal with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upstairs room, prepare it there, verse 13, and they left and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. What we need to know is that if you remember back to our series or even in your own personal reading of Scripture, at this point in time, Jesus is public enemy number one, right? Remember we looked at how he went into the temple and he, he showed everybody how they had been desecrating the temple. They had failed to be God's light to the nations. And, and the Jewish leaders are like, this guy, who does he think he is? So Jesus is kind of keeping low, right? He cannot go prepare this meal, but he's, he's made his arrangements. And why I said this is a little James Bond secret kind of a thing is he gets a guy, he's like, you're going to go into town, you're going to see a guy carrying a jug of water. Do you remember all of the other stories where people carry jugs of water? Remember like when Jacob, uh, you know, when J uh, Abraham wants his son Isaac to have a wife, the servant finds who's carrying the water? It's the women, right? When Jacob runs away, goes back to where his family from, he sees his future wife carrying water. To see a man carrying water is a little bit weird, right? You see the man there, wink, wink, follow him. Jesus has done some sneaky stuff. He refers to himself as the teacher. The guy knows who the teacher is. Okay, wink, wink. All right, Jesus has talked to me. We're putting this thing together. So I want you to see that Jesus has gone to efforts to make this happen. He's made available a room, a place to celebrate. This is how important it is for him that this meal happens. Can you see it? He's gone to extra effort to make sure, no, everything has to be just right. So we pick up our story in verse 14. When the hour came, so the preparations have been made, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. I had two pictures for you to see today. The first picture is probably the picture we are most familiar with when we think of the Last Supper, right? Hopefully it's there. You guys familiar with that picture? Very famous picture. When I was 12 years, 12 years old, a guy wrote a book about this picture. You guys remember that book? And it caused controversy all over the world, and there were meanings in the picture and all this sort of stuff. We often think of this picture, but in a real Jewish Passover setting, it looks something like the next picture. This was low resolution, sorry, but it was the best picture I could find. Passover is an intimate experience with my family at a small table usually, not this big, but probably something like this where we can sit on cush cushions, we're relaxed, we're comfortable, we're with the people we love. I should move this back because half of you can't see. You see over here? 
Sorry, Grace, you can't see that they're here, okay? Okay, trust me, all right? So it's this intimate environment, okay? Now, this meal is being celebrated for 3,500 years today, right? It's the longest continually celebrated meal that we are aware of. And in this meal, there are four cups that you will drink from. And in Luke's story, three of those cups are mentioned. We think it's just one cup, but there are three specific cups that you drink from as you go through this meal. And I'm going to say a blessing over the first cup. Usually this would be done in Hebrew. You want to thank Jesus that I'm not going to do it in Hebrew because that would be a bit... It might be a bit comical. I need to learn it. It would be sung, by the way. Now, it's a blessing. We are not asking God to bless the drink. In fact, we are going to be blessing God. The Jewish paradigm is not to ask God to bless us. The, the, the doxology says, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And so the context of blessing, we're going to say three blessings today, and every time it's directed at God. So, bow your heads. We're going to say a blessing. May you be blessed, O Lord our God, King of the world, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. You guys are now free to drink from the first cup. All right. So, I'm going to have this one over here. Uh, there's plenty, right? So, you'll be okay. So, you'll start to drink this through the, the, through the meal. Okay. Now... Um, I want to read to you, I'm going to continue reading from our story. So when the hour came, in verse 14, he, Jesus, reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. You can see how important it is. For I say to you, in verse 16, I shall not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup... And given thanks, this is the first cup. He said, take it, this, and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. So he says the blessing, he's drinking, but if you're the disciples, you're like, hey, something strange is happening here. He's taken the cup, we, we, we're used to the cup, but he says... This is a cup that symbolizes something special. I'm not going to drink this cup until I come back. Okay? This cup is going to be connected with my suffering. This cup is going to be about what God is doing, his kingdom movements. Okay? This is a cup that's going to, it's going to be fully realized when I die tomorrow. Okay? Now, you're a disciple, you're sitting down, and you're like, um, what's going on? Peter looks at James, James looks at Peter like, is this normal? This isn't normal, okay? This was a very weird meal, and Jesus is so excited to share it. So, after you've had this blessing over the wine, the first part of the meal proper is that you will dip carpus, or you'll dip some a vegetable into carpus. Now, here is my... Carpus, okay? I'm going to give this a little swirl. Okay, we've got some carpus here. And you're like, what is carpus? Uh, ladies, I'm going to ask you to grab a piece of, um, um, of the herb, okay? This is some parsley. Uh, I will grab some as well. Okay, here's, some, here's some, some, some herb. And at this point in the meal, we've said a blessing over our first cup. And what we will do is we're going to dip our herb into this bowl of quote-unquote carpus, and we're going to eat it. Can you do that, ladies? All right. Now, just so you know, yeah, just give it a nice old dip. The carpus is a bowl of salty water. Anybody want to have some salty water and herbs? All right, we're just going to dip that in. I've put lots of Himalayan rock salt in there, so it's nice and salty. Is this tasty, girls? I mean, it's, not, it's not the nicest. Now, at this point, a child would say... Why are you doing that? It's a part of the meal. And somebody, Harry, do you want to say why? Harry, why are you, can you ask me why you're doing that, Dad? Why are you doing that? Good question. <laughs> well, and the Jewish tradition is, 
We're celebrating Passover. And Passover is the deliverance of Israel from which country? Egypt. Well, this is the part of the meal which reminds us of how we got there. Because what happened was some brothers betrayed a brother. They threw him down a pit and they sold him to some slave traders, right? And they went home. They went to dad. They got an animal. They killed it. They smeared its blood on a coat. We remember why we got in Egypt. Because a brother betrayed a brother. And that salty water carpus is to remind us of that blood. That innocent blood that got somebody in trouble. Interesting, right? Interesting. Thank you for eating some carpus. It's really salty. (laughs) So we continue on. And then another time... A young, the youngest member of the family, again, is going to ask us a question and say, why, why are we doing this? Carrie, can you ask, why are we doing this, Dad? Why are we doing this? Oh, I'm glad you asked. At this point, we will read the whole Exodus story. Who's, who's ready for that? <laughs> Nobody's ready for that. I'm going to read you the abbreviated version in Deuteronomy 26 and verse 5 through to 9. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt with a few people, and he lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice, And saw our misery, our toil, and our oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. With great terror and with signs and wonders, he brought us to this place and gave us this land. A land flowing with milk and honey. That's why we're doing this, guys. Now what I want you to do is, we're not Jewish, but the Jewish person, as you will see, is so strongly rooted to this narrative. And today I need you to be strongly rooted like this is your experience. Okay, could you do that with me? Can you imagine that your ancestors were enslaved? For some of us, that's literally the truth. For literally for my ancestor, they were slaves. But for some of us, it's not the, not the story. But I need you to share in this story as if it were your own. At this point, a psalm would be read. I'm going to read a summary of Psalm 113, and this would be a blessing over the second cup. Girls, you have to finish your first cup, because we're doing the second cup. All right, get, come on, hurry up. All right. <laughs> Just poured very generous cups. <laughs> so in Psalm 113, you'd read a Psalm 113 through to 118, one of those Psalms. But in Psalm 113, Israel is a barren woman whom God has delivered from Egyptian bondage. And she's been given... Uh, a fruitless, uh, she's fruitless, uh, she's been given fruitfulness, sorry, in a new land. God's redemptive work has transformed her fallen circumstances. And God is going to break in and hurt uh, through the pain and the hurt and, and give her new life. He will redeem what has been lost. And the palm, uh, the, there's a, the psalm ends with, with a hallelujah. So I'm just going to say a quick prayer. Father, thank you that in Scripture you transformed the experience of broken Israel. You rescued her in a way that nobody else could have dreamed. Nobody could do this in their own strength. But God, you stepped in and you brought fruitfulness in a barren situation. And we remember that. For many of us, we have also been through our fruitless experiences, but you bring us fruitfulness. And so we pray this blessing over this second cup as we remember how you can bring life from nothing. Amen. Hey, feel free to have your second cup. I haven't even finished my first one. All right. So you can take this as your time. Take your time. Okay. So um, Paul, the Apostle Paul had a rabbi, Gamaliel. He's one of the most famous first century rabbis. And he had a lot to say about Passover. 
He said you can celebrate Passover a number of different ways, just as we might celebrate communion differently to Casey, which would do it different to Lilydale, which would do it different to Burwood. I mean, we all can do it a little bit differently, but Gamaliel said there were three things you needed to do. You needed unleavened bread, you need some bitter herbs, we haven't got to these bits yet, and you need a Passover lamb. He said these are the essential things. So we're going to, we, these are all in our meal. Now, when it comes to the unleavened bread, I'm going to read to you Exodus 12, 39, because this is where we see it. With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Most of us are familiar with this, but this is the unleavened bread. And I've got some, got some at Woolworths, okay? And in Luke 22, verse 19, Jesus prays over this. And when he had taken some of the bread, he gave thanks. Now, the Jewish blessing in English, may you be blessed, O Lord, our God, King of the world, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Now, Jesus will break the bread, it says, and he gave it to them saying, and this is where things get different, this is my body, which is being given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. So ladies, feel free to take a piece of bread. This is um, unleavened rye bread. You can buy this. It's pretty dry. You could break a piece off if you like. I'm going to break a piece off here. Okay. There's no way we can eat all of this. Your mouth will be so dry. Okay. But here it is. If you want to try some afterwards, by all means, come along and I'll, I've got plenty. So they will eat this to remind them, right, of the haste of leaving Egypt. Okay. Jesus now, and we're familiar with this, but he is ascribing new meaning, new significance to this bread. This is my body, right? I am going to be ripped and whipped and scourged and tormented tomorrow. My body will be broken for you. Can you sort of see how this lands differently as you're sitting at a table and eating it? I know, it, I don't want to say that what we do today has lost its meaning, but I think when you're, ju- you're really sitting there and you're eating a chunk of bread, yeah, there's a lot to think about, right? As you're slowly digesting this meal, you're thinking, you're processing. Jesus thought the most powerful way would to be to engage all five of our senses, right? Not just listening, not just hearing, but to engage all of our senses through this process. So now we come time into the program where we eat some bitter herbs. I've, I've warned these girls, there's some, some properly bitter herbs. Now, at this point in the Jewish meal, um, what they would do is they will, to eat the bitter herbs, because the meal was broken bread and bitter herbs with lamb. Bitter herbs that they usually, if you go to a Jewish Seder today, you will eat horseradish, grated horseradish. I've got some wasabi here. If you buy most wasabi, <laughs> Dad's like, no, thank you. If you go to most uh, sushi places or go to the supermarket, have a look at the tube of wasabi in the Asian Isle. The active ingredient is horseradish. It's actually not wasabi. Real wasabi costs a lot of money. So if this is being dyed green, it's actually horseradish. Now, I, I've actually been to a Jewish Seder and I sat at the kids' table. And I saw these kids piling a big spoon onto a hunk of bread. And I'm like, okay, went in Rome. And I hunk this giant slab. And guys, it really induces some tears. Okay. Um, Exodus 1.14 says, They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Ladies, if you want to get some bread, you can put some wasabi on there. Okay, and have a go. I'm going to lead from, by example, as, as your pastor, and I'm going to take a generous, you don't have to be as generous as I will. Yeah, take a, take a spoonful and put a little bit if you want. Okay, I've got my second cup here to keep me going uh, if I need it. All right. Um, okay, so just so you can see, I've, that's, that's significant. So you can see it. <laughs> okay. Now, the reason why you put so much is because you really want to engage the tear ducts. (coughs) 
I love you guys. <laughs> so, I want you to see this, because this doesn't work if you do a little bit. You have to do a lot. But they do this, because this is exactly what happens. <laughs> um, kids don't do this at home. <laughs> so, this is literally why they do this, because it induces tears. It reminds them of the bitter experience, right? There's a reason. <laughs> I'm okay now. <laughs> the nice thing about horseradish, it's, it's not like chili. It's, it's there for a minute and it's gone. Um, okay? So, we've gone through um, our bitter herbs. We've gone through our bread. But that leaves our final part of the service, Right? Some lamb. Can somebody get me a tissue, please? <laughs> so, the final part is everyone's got tissues ready to go. Um, about a week before, oh, we've got some right here, just in case I break down. <laughs> All right. So, now about a week before, Dad, so in this family, you guys okay? I didn't even ask. You all right? <laughs> they're, they're brave, right? About a week before, Dad would have gone to the markets and he would have purchased a lamb, okay? So we don't actually have lamb today, we've got beef, because um, you can't buy lamb, and I didn't want to go to the kebab shop and buy their lamb, because that's not nice. But I wanted to get an animal for effect, because I think it's important. So you would have picked out a lamb which would have been about a year old, and Dad would bring it with the family to the temple, Priest would have, would have slaughtered it and caught the blood in a bowl, and we take the lamb home. The priests, the priests literally are serving as butchers. Sorry to be a bit graphic, but they're literally performing the function of a butcher en masse. How many people are in Jerusalem? 100,000. How many lambs are being killed? Okay. The salty water. It's all happening, Right. The, the priests will, 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 they will do the sacrifice, but they'll also cut it up, and Dad will bring the lamb home with family, okay? And they catch the blood in a bowl, and it's a very significant part of the, the process, right? God will use that blood, we are reminded, right, on the doorpost of every home. For Egyptians and Israelites alike, and everybody in between, they'd get the hyssop branch and just plaster it all over their doorposts. Okay, and if, if you had that over your home, you were safe, okay? At this point now, we're going to pray a blessing over our third cup. Jesus, we're told in verse 20, in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten. So they've had this meal, Let's, we can have some lamb if you want to, or beef, okay, we're going to take some of this, all right? Who would have eaten this, okay? At this point, Jesus will say a third blessing over the third cup. May you be blessed, O Lord, our God, King of the world. You create the fruit of the vine. And that's our third cup. Jesus takes this cup and he said, this cup is poured out for you. It's the cup that's associated with this lamb. It's the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Can you see how eating this with this meat, you're connecting experiences? I'm not saying it's lost on us without it, but going through this meal really just helps you to think through what's going on. Again, the disciples would be like, what is going on? This is just the lamb that they killed, so the angel of death would not, you know, harm anyone. And Jesus says, no, I am that lamb. I am the one who's keeping you alive through all of this experience. 
And so kind of concludes our meal. We're going to break up soon, but I really want you to think through this. Jesus was enacting a new covenant on this evening. Covenants are agreements between two parties. And I want you to think, what, if anything, has been my part in this meal? What has been our part? Our part has simply been this, to take and eat, to take and drink. There is nothing that you and I do to make ourselves any better in the process before God. This is 100% the actions of a God who loves you. There is nothing more you can do at this meal to make yourself more worthy. I need to say this to a Seventh-day Adventist person in the room today. Can you hear me? There is nothing I do to make myself worthy to eat this meal. The meal is available to everyone. That meal was available to the slave. It was available to Pharaoh. The choice is yours whether you will eat the meal. Some of you may be deep in sin right now and you feel like, I can't participate in this. Friend, there is nothing you can do to change how God feels about you. And somebody might disagree with me on this, but I am very serious about this. If you feel that you want to participate in the accomplished works of Jesus Christ at the cross, this table is for you. If you, we didn't announce it last week because I wasn't here. Some of you didn't know that communion was coming. You haven't had the time to think through your life, to go back and go, you know what, I yelled at my wife, I was grumpy at this person, I have this, you know, this sin issue, and you're like, I can't eat it today because I'm not good enough. The point is, you're never good enough. Please understand that. We are never good enough to eat this meal, and yet Jesus offers it to us. Amen? If you did not get to prepare this week, if you did not go through your usual you know, actions, I don't want to say that it's all for naught. I think it's important we process what's going on. I just need us to know today, there is nothing we do to make ourselves holy enough to sit here. There will never be anything we do that makes us worthy to sit at this table. It is 100% the complete work of Jesus in our life. This is a grace of God. This is something he does for us, something we could never do on our own. There is no way these slaves could set themselves free from what Pharaoh was doing. I mean, we keep the Sabbath day to remember that God set us free from Pharaoh. Do you know that? Could we do that? No. So if you want to participate, this table is for you. You may not be baptized, you may have been the first time in church, but if you are feeling drawn to the person of Jesus and what he's done for us, then you're, you're welcome to sit at the table today. We're going to break now to wash our feet. There's another part of this service that we didn't explore today. But Jesus says, it, it, he asks us to humble ourselves, right? He asks us to get into the mindset of this meal by humbling ourselves. And so right now, we're going to go wash feet. Uh, next door, some spaces have been prepared for the men and the women. Are there any family spaces? I don't know. I think they're all out getting busy. But next door, is there any family space, Christian, or is it just for men and women? There's an overflow room. Okay. So if you'd like to participate, please come along. We've got things ready there for you to participate in the washing of the feet, and then we're going to return, and we as a community... I'm going to celebrate the fourth cup as a family. Amen? Thank you for being my family today. Now we've got to welcome the rest of the church into our family. So please make your way. We've got some things for families and kids to do here if you want to, or if you need to stay behind. But this is welcome for everybody. I strongly encourage you to reflect on what Jesus has done and wants to do for you free of charge. Amen. Thank you very much, ladies. <laughs>